Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. I hope you can hear me well. So my name is Marco Micheli. I work at uh, ESA's NEO Coordination Center in uh, Frascati near Rome. And I mostly do astrometry of uh, asteroids, of near-Earth asteroids in particular, mostly with the official goal of planetary defense. But of course, I'm also doing science with them. So what I'm going to tell you about in this talk is uh, general outline of what astrometry is, why we do astrometry, and specifically what we've done with NOT and what can be done with NOT in the field of astrometry of small bodies. So the first slide is just a very general introduction here on what we define as small solar system objects. It's the five things you see here. Of course, the, the ones that we really focus on, we will really focus on are basically asteroids and comets, which are treated nearly more or less the same way. Of course, things like meteoroids have a very different kind of science. They're still small bodies, but they're not telescopic targets typically. But asteroids and comets, and in a certain sense, tuning objects also are routine targets for telescopes of all kinds of apertures. And uh, we will try to see how a telescope of the class of NOT and with the peculiarities of NOT can provide valuable scientific data uh, when it comes to observing asteroids. And uh, my, the focus of my talk is actually pretty narrow, it's specifically on astrometry, and therefore it's specifically on imaging, and imaging in particular at visual wavelength, because in general, high precision astrometry of small bodies and in general, anything that is has a solar spectrum is typically done in the wave, wave the visual wavelength range. So, for the rest of this talk, I will mostly be focusing on imaging of faint sources that move in the sky, so asteroids, and can apply all of what I'm saying to comets or other objects too, of course. So, what is astrometry? I mean, it might sound trivial, but it's not as trivial as people may think. The, of course, the obvious definition of what astrometry is, is the first bullet point here, is the coordinates in the plane of sky that essentially an inclination basically of an object. Here already, there is a little extra element which is hidden in the word absolute that I have here at the beginning. What I'm going to discuss here is absolute astrometry, meaning in the sense I, I want to give, to describe how we get arrays and decks of an asteroid in the reference frame of the, of the sky. So, not like relative to another body, like sometimes, sometimes people do for planetary satellites or exoplanets. This is absolute astrometry, meaning I just want to give you array and deck in the ICRS system of an object. And that's, of course, what people in, understand as astrometry. But there are three more ingredients that are actually equally important, if not more important, than the one above. And they are sometimes neglected and not sufficiently paid attention to. One is the precise determination of time. Uh, we are dealing with moving objects. And uh, of course, astrometry, arrays and decks, are valid if you can tell where, when they were taken, so the exact time of the observation. And unfortunately, for a variety of professional telescopes, this is a problem. And we will see later that it's not a problem for not. It behaves well in this regard. But it's not unusual that telescopes have Sign very significant delays between the actual exposure time and the time tag of the FITS file that we get from the telescope. Of course, this can completely ruin the value of astrometry when we are dealing with moving objects. The third one is the location of the telescope, which is also important. And uh, if you are observing something that is very close, like a near Earth asteroid, it could actually be that changing your location by a few hundred meters makes a difference because the parallax is very, very significant. So the other thing we need to do, which nowadays is trivial, of course, we have GPS receivers in our phone. It's just extremely simple, but in the past it wasn't, is to get the location of your telescope, the location of where we are observing from. And fourth, and not least, and not last, of course, but very, very important, is everything you, you do, as every physical measure, should have an uncertainty attached to it. And this has historically been an issue for astrometry of small bodies. There has been very little attention to the concept of uncertainties for historical reasons. Things are changing now, but it's very important to keep that in mind. OK, so what is astrometry? Basically, it's conceptually very simple. It's 
determining arrays and decks of an object by combining two different things. One is to measure your object in your image. So basically locating the center of your source in pixel coordinates, so saying you know, it's at that particular X and Y coordinate in your array. And then the second one is to use in an indirect way, typically the presence of stars in the field, to derive what we call an astrometric solution, which is a map of every pixel to sky coordinates. And this is typically done by using a star, stellar catalog, for example, the Gaia stellar catalog, and mapping, creating a map that matches the coordinates of known catalog stars in the image with the pixels so that you can now have a function that converts pixels to, to arrays and decks. And of course, you measure the array and deck pixels in your image, and you have now the array and deck in sky coordinates. So this is contextually very easy, of course, both of these steps can have tricky components to them, especially the second one was actually very tricky until we had a catalog like Gaia, which is extremely accurate and now allows us to do step two in a solid, unbiased way. So before showing you some examples of this, I just want to tell you why this thing is important. Why do we care about astrometry? And why, in particular, we care about what I call high precision astrometry, with this, which is basically simply astrometry done right, done following the four points that I listed here. So, with all the proper elements of a proper scientific measurement. And, and you may think of astrometry as a sort of a small side job for, for, for moving object science, but it's actually very important for a variety of reasons. The first one is that if any moving object basically will be lost if you don't do proper astrometry because you need to track it after discovering it because it moves of course it's, it's trivial but it's not sometimes very nearby objects can be lost within hours of discovery unless they are properly followed up and the follow-up is doable only if you have good astrometry to begin with the second thing is of course it Without astrometry, you cannot determine the trajectory of the of your of your object, the orbit of your object, and uh, the orbit is basically what like what uh, creates the science. I mean, most moving objects are main belt asteroids. You don't have a lot of cool science to do with the cool science you do on the peculiar objects, peculiar asteroids and comets, and to know that they are peculiar is basically to know their orbit. So again, astrometry is the starting ingredient for that. We discover an interstellar asteroid, we won't know it's an interstellar asteroid unless we have its orbit, and we won't have its orbit unless we have good astrometry with proper error bars to know if it's compatible with being an interstellar object or a solar system object. And this is just an example, there are plenty. And uh, third, of course, every time you want to do any observations of a moving object, you need to know what it is. And sometimes you need to know what it is very, very well. And very well means uh, sub arc second for some observing techniques, spectroscopy, adaptive optics, a lot of things, sending a space of there or something. So you need very good precision of your knowledge of where the object is. And of course, you do that via guest astrometry. Fourth, uh, actually, astrometry is tied to the dynamics of the asteroid, of course, of the object. And uh, if you do it right, you can actually do science with purely with astrometry by measuring things on the asteroid. For example, measuring non-gravitational forces. An example is what we call the Yarkovsky effect, which is the sort of a thermal effect on the motion of an asteroid that tells us a lot on how the asteroid is made, the, the physical composition, how it of course reacts to the, the sunlight hitting on, onto it. This is of course it's physical information, but it's physical information that you can get from dynamics and therefore you can get from astrometry. And of course, last but not least, uh, I'm working at an ESA center that is dedicated to planetary defense. So doing astrometry is basically what we need, is the starting ingredient for any determination of possible impacts of asteroids with the Earth. And that's, of course, uh, the, the goal of planetary defense and the goal of all the, not really science, but the sort of even civil protection, we can say, we can do in case we want to, we can predict the impact of an asteroid in the future with the Earth. 
So how does it work? How do we really do this thing? And what do we use? There are basically four different kind of players, telescopic players in the field of astronomy. The first player is what we call the surveys. So basically these are telescopes that are dedicated to discovering asteroids. And their focus is numbers, basically. It's finding as many new things as they can and uh, announcing them to the world. They are not specifically tasked to do very good astrometry, and especially they're not tasked to do extended time coverage with astrometry. They're just tasked to do discover itself, so telling the world, now there's something new there that we haven't seen before. The second type of telescopes that play a role in this chain of processes is what we call immediate follow-up. So it, since the surveys just discover things and they don't do anything else, we need telescopes to react to discovery announcements within sometimes hours or a day or less sometimes from the discovery announcement. And this is done typically with smaller telescopes, major class, sometimes even less, but it has to be done in very short, on very short notice. And this is a particular kind of instruments and particular kind of mode of operation that we need to have. And we do a lot of that here in ESA is to be able to access a telescope all over the world. And this is important because the time scales are less than 24 hours. And uh, if you, of course, need to do an observation on that time scale, you need longitudinal coverage around the world. So you want to be able to have a telescope when it's dark at, at any given time. So you need coverage of the whole globe, basically. The third type of uh, telescopes we need is what we call extended follow-up. Basically, it's uh, telescopes that can do observations of an asteroid for the weeks or months after discovery. Of course, not of every asteroid, only of the very small subset of interesting asteroids. And this is where a telescope like NOT will come into play and can come into play. And telescopes of this aperture, you know, two to four meter class, typically come into play because they can go fainter than the discovery telescopes, so they can see objects when they get fainter, typically when they recede from Earth after discovery. And they can do that on time scales of days to weeks. And uh, it's actually particularly useful to have these time scales on two to four meter class telescopes because it's a bit easier to get, for example, direct or discretionary time or your know, pro programs on telescopes of, of that class. And it's important because we typically don't have sufficient advance warning on our targets to schedule follow-up maybe with the, the typical proposal cadence with a six month to a year cadence of normal CAC proposal. So telescopes of the NOT class typically are easier to deal with when you want to have a sort of an open process of proposing and getting access to telescopes. And uh, of course, the last, what we call deep follow-up, is typically left for the biggest telescopes on the planet, the LTE or you know, the eight, 10 meters class telescopes. And this is what you do for the, the highest priority of objects, typically months or years or decades after discovery, if there is something really important that you need to do on that particular object. And those are typically on slightly different time scales. Of course, it's used to have useful to have near real time access to eight, 10 meter class facilities, but it's not as easy. So in this case, maybe we can go through a tra more traditional proposal mode. And sometimes we have to do, go through a more traditional proposal mode. So lot three here is where a telescope like NOT can play its role. And uh, here I just want to list some things that may not be trivial for most people to, to, to realize, but they are the key performances that a telescope like NOT needs to have in order to be able to do useful science on asteroids, comets, and moving objects in general. And uh, to my knowledge, NOT has all of this, but I'm just going to go through them because it's, it's important in general for these task telescopes if they, want, if they need to be used for, for solar system science. Of course, aperture, I mean, a telescope with a few meters of aperture is useful because it can get faint. I mean, this is trivial. But I got some numbers there. I'm going to give you some more evidence of these numbers there. A telescope like NOT can go very faint. And uh, I'll show you in uh, one of the next few slides how faint you see the numbers there. The reason why I'm saying this 
here is that it's a bit beyond the normal um, magnitude range of operation, but astrometry just doesn't need a lot of signal noise. You just need to see your thing. So you can do astrometry down to the very limit of what your telescope can. The second point is what I already briefly mentioned, is the ability to have sort of a quick reaction to proposal to, to, to targets that are not known at the time of the proposal, so TO mode, direct discretionary time, these things. And of course, the ability to use the telescope, of course, if you have an approved program on it, on reasonably short notice, so no pre-scheduled uh, schedules for the semester or things like that, which are not compatible with the discovery of new objects. Then, of course, it needs an imager, a good imager with good sensitivity, because you, as point one, you need to go faint, of course. And since your goal is to go faint, you need to get all the light you can. So you need to have a telescope that can go unfiltered, completely unfiltered. You need to get all the photos that you can get into your, your camera, into your detector. And unfortunately, there are a lot of professional telescopes. That is not the case. Not too unfiltered, but other telescopes have this limitation. They cannot observe unless you put a filter, and that already kills you. Kills, I mean, sometimes 70, 80% of the flux that you could get otherwise. Of course, seeing, seeing helps, and helps even more than what you could think for astrometry because the astrometric quality you get is directly connected to your seeing. And last but not least, the ability to point low over the horizon. And this is something that, to my knowledge, not can do. Can point actually to like six degrees, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it might sound like a particularly useless thing for people who are used to, for example, non-solar system science, because just wait maybe a few a few months and your target will be transiting in a more easy, easy time. That's not the case for moving objects. Your asteroid may be physically always at low elongation, maybe. And so you have to point low in uh, around sunset to see it. Think, for example, of objects that have an orbit inside the orbit of the Earth. You want to observe any, anything like that, you have to point close to the sun. So you have to point low and in twilight. This is uh, an ability that is for many telescopes is not available and a uh, good thing to have. You can do a lot of science on objects that other telescopes cannot reach just by being able to point low over the horizon. And of course, these are all things that not can do. So uh, advantage of your specific telescope for this kind of science. So now I'm going to just present two examples of things we did in the recent past with not to make it into a telescope good for astrometry. And I'm going to start with a campaign we participated in uh, a few months ago in the fall of 2021 to check the timing quality of the telescope. So the idea in this case was to observe a very fast moving asteroid, something that was uh, moving fast enough that you could, by knowing its orbit very well and by using the positional knowledge you have, you can indirectly see if your specific measurements are affected by time bias. This was actually done by the International Asteroid Warning Network, which is a UN mandated group that deals specifically with the threat of asteroid planetary defense. And uh, it uh, creates a network of observers and telescopes that can dedicate some effort to planetary defense observation. So with the idea of observing threatening asteroids. And actually, I'm highlighting this here as a sort of an invitation for NOT and for the people who work at NOT to maybe become a member of ION, become a member of this institution if you're interested in astrometry, in using NOT for planetary science, because basically that's where things happen. I mean, this is a campaign organized by them, but in case a real asteroid threat happens, the institutions and the people who are into this, this network are the ones who will be the major players in case of any asteroid that it poses a significant threat. It's an international in, uh, institution. It's mandated by the, by the United Nations, so it's a high-level um, group. And uh, so I, I suggest that if there is an interest, that NOT can become a member of this entity. But then the results of the campaign itself, we observed this asteroid for a few nights, and uh, we actually produced data that was used by the campaign people 
to determine the time bias of nodes. And turns out there is a time bias. What you can see here in the figure is the each cross is the, the, the timing bias of that particular observation based on where we knew the asteroid was from it all. And it's about a 0.4 second of time bias. This may sound negligible, but it's not. I mean, a bias at that level is can dramatically affect the quality of the data you get. The good thing is that it's pretty constant, it's pretty stable, and that you can just compensate for it. So now that we know that there is a 0.4 second bias, you can just, every time you do astrometry from not, you can compensate for that. And now you have an accuracy of your timestamp that is of the order of the scatter of your uh, timing here. So it's less than a tenth of a second. And that's basically the goal of all high precision astrometry in telescopes. So this is an interesting result, and it's sort of a starting point for the ability of using NOT to asteroid science. The second technical thing, again, is the location part. And uh, it's to be able to specify where NOT is on the Earth with sufficient precision. In the past, people who were doing astrometry from NOT were just using what we call an IAU code for La Palma. It's a generic uh, code for the summit, basically. And uh, it's just under the assumption that if you tell somebody that you observed from telescope 950 La Palma, it will automatically give you the coordinates of your telescope. The thing is that that particular code, IAU code, corresponds to a location that is about half a kilometer away from not near the William Herschel telescope, actually. And uh, 500 meters, if you want to observe something close, is not sufficient. It might actually become your leading source of error in your astrometric process. So what we did is to get proper latitude, longitude, and altitude of not and ask uh, IAU to give a code to NOT. And now that code exists. Code Z23 is specifically associated to the Northern Optical Telescope. And it should be used, actually, it must be used every time you do astrometry from NOT, because by using it, you tell whoever uses your data that that particular observation comes from NOT and from the location of NOT. So now this was a bit technical so far. Let's do some science here. Let's present some science here. Uh, this is an observation we did two years ago, a set of observations, actually a whole work, a whole uh, science project that we did with, mostly with people from NOT uh, a few years ago, two years ago. And uh, the target is an asteroid called 2020 CD3 that was discovered on February 15, 2020. And uh, it had the peculiarity that within a few days, we knew that this was not in, basically in orbit around the sun, but it was in orbit around the Earth. It's what we technically call temporary captured objects. Sometimes in the media, they're called mini moons. They are natural asteroids, natural objects that are captured in orbit around the Earth. And they typically stay in orbit for a few months to a few years. They sort of behave like a, a tiny little moon that is typically temporary and it's typically in a pretty chaotic orbit around the asteroid. You can see down there the orbit of this object. It came in in August 2017. It stayed in orbit around the Earth with this pretty crazy wild orbit for a few years. And then in April 15, 2020, it actually left the orbit of the Earth, went back into a normal geocentric orbit. So, uh, there was a, a, a very nice uh, scientific collaboration around this that was created. And we were able to use NOT to basically do the bulk of the astrometric coverage of this object. At, uh, starting from about a week after discovery and with a roughly a weekly cadence, we got very good astrometry with about 0.1 arc second uh, astrometric precision or better in many nights. And we were, could actually go very faint. We were actually the last ones to see the asteroid after it left the the orbit of the Earth and de basically departed into a heliocentric orbit, getting fainter and fainter, farther and farther away. So we were the last ones to see it, because with not. And I want to give you an example of what you can do with not uh, on this object. Uh, this is something I was briefly mentioning at the beginning, but I think it's important to, to, to know is 
Astrometry is position. Position basically means you to see where the object is. And uh, what you see here is an example of a detection of this asteroid, last detection of this asteroid, with not. And this little dot you see here is had a magnitude of about 25.5. The limiting magnitude of the data set we had is about 26. So you can get to magnitude 26 with not. Of course, you're not going to do a lot of science, but you can do astrometric science very well. We actually got astrometry with a precision of 0.21 second from this little dot you see there. And uh, this is what you can do. You can go to 26 magnitude with the telescope by just dedicating, in this case, less than an hour of telescope time. It's really impressive. It really, really shows the capabilities of this telescope. In, uh, if you want to see it in physical terms, you're now Marco? looking at a one meter asteroid, basically, 3.3 million Marco, we kilometers need to wrap up. I'm sorry. Really impressive. OK, so just uh, to conclude, I have a slide of things that you can do with NOT, just uh, very simple things. Of course, we've seen most of them, but I just want to leave them here to, to show that the telescope can have a, a very important role in, uh, in this field, in the field of asteroid comets, small bodies in general. And uh, all I said was about imaging, but I also want to remember that NOT has other capabilities to do other things on asteroid physical characterization, and in particular, I want to highlight this thing, the last point here, polarimetry. And NOT is one of the few uh, professional telescopes that have a polarimeter, have the ability to do polarimetric measurement. Actually, a lot of people are very interested in this, including us in ESA, the, the, the big safety program where I'm working is trying to set up a collaboration uh, with NOT to do polarimetry. So I invite you to keep this in mind because polarimetry is very powerful for asteroid science. It's basically the best tool we have on Earth without going to space to determine the size of an asteroid. So this is something that hopefully will be exploited also on the ESA side maybe in the future. So it's just a comment for you. Keep in mind that you have that capability and it's very, very useful. That's all I have for you. Thank you very much. And uh, sorry if I went a little bit late. If you have any questions for me, I'm available just to free to ask. Thank you very much. And these are my email addresses if you want to just write to me. Thanks.